Okay, thank you very much, Professor Magdi, for the introduction. And as you see, I will talk about the enhanced recovery after neuroanesthesia. And uh, we will explore some points uh, with how we can apply the concepts and the components of enhanced recovery in the neurosurgical patients. First, I, my talk will be focused on the supratentorial craniotomy because uh, neuroanesthesia may include spinal anesthesia as well, but the spinal anesthesia overlapped between the orthopedic and the neurosurgery. So my talk will focus on the elective supratentorial craniotomy. And the overview of the lectures, as you see, it will cover five points. This regarding the pre-anesthesia clinic, how to evaluate the patient with some focus in the nutrition and the anemia, immediate preoperative care after admission of the patient, intraoperative anesthetic management, which include 10 points. I will discuss some of them, not everything, and the emergence from the anesthesia and the last point, the post-operative care, which includes the cognitive dysfunctions and pain and the ICU care. Uh, actually, the concept of enhanced recovery is an old concept. As you see in 1934, we have been very cautious about allowing our patients to be out from the bed at an early date or as soon as possible because there is a lot of advantage for this early recovery. So in short, we need short stay in the hospital. So why we need this short stay in the hospital for our patient? Hospital is usually associated with fasting, sleep disruption, immobilization, medications error, and the medical errors. For medical errors, something a little bit strange in United States, Regarding the causes of death in the United States in two, uh, 2013, the medical error is the third cause of death after heart disease and cancer. That's why the short stay of the hospital is desirable to minimize the side effect and the problem with the hospital admission. The enhanced recovery started with the day case surgery, this concept more than 20 years ago, and Dr. Mahmoud will talk about that very soon. And then the office-based or ambulatory anesthesia, fast track anesthesia, this is a patient bypass the recovery room immediately to the ward after full recovery in the operating room. After that, the enhanced recovery after anesthesia and surgery, this since about 10 uh, years or maybe 11 years, the concept of enhanced recovery. And now we have the society which established 10 years ago, the Enhanced uh, Recovery Society, and they did the first world meeting or conference in, two, uh, in uh, 2012. And the next meeting will be 2021, will be in July in United States. One of the great progress in the enhanced recovery, we can do day case surgery for hip and knee replacement. Something is very strange. According to the strict protocol for selection of the patient criteria, as you see here, the patient may be as a one or two, good social support, hemoglobin is more than 13, and there is a lot of criteria to select your patient to can go for hip replacement or knee replacement as a day case surgery. And then some preoperative uh, considerations as well. Then intraoperative management, you can do regional or general anesthesia, it doesn't matter. And the minimally invasive approach by the surgeon, you may give tranexamic acid, you may use local infiltration and control the hypotension, then many points in the postoperative care. One of the issues that the patient should be limited blood loss and he can check his hemoglobin after that for four days. Anyway, it is not my issue to discuss this point, just to tell you the progress in the enhanced recovery now, you can, de, you can do the hip replacement or re, knee replacement as a day case surgery. And now, including more sick patient, 
as you see here, the neonatal intestinal surgery also have special protocol or guidelines to be involved in the enhanced recovery. Also, more, patient, more sick patient, like patient with obstructive sleep apnea, can be included as well in the enhanced pathway. And the point is that then don't tell this patient is not fit for the enhanced recovery pathway. But tell the enhanced recovery pathway is not fit or not adapted well for the sick patient. So this is the idea now, to involve a more sick patient in the enhanced recovery pathway. And because most of the surgical subspecialities have its guidelines or its protocol, you can find these all guidelines in the website of the society, including almost all the surgical subspeciality. But nothing is mentioned about neuroanesthesia and the neurosurgery. That's why my talk today. Also, the annual meeting for the Society of Neuro science or neurocritical care and in sociology, which is done three or four months ago, they have more than 80 abstract and nothing in, uh, mentioned about the recovery after neuroanesthesia or neurosurgery. Maybe something is talked about spinal surgery, but again, about craniotomy, nothing is mentioned in this conference. Now, one of the most important point for the anesthesiologist or ICU physician to prevent the secondary injury, because the injured disease just operated on brain is very reliable for secondary injury. And everybody should be aware about these 10 factors or more fa uh, which, which may precipitate the secondary injury by early detection and the prevention. The most common hypotension and the hypoxemia and the hypovolemia. In neurosurgical patients, you have to differentiate between the hypotension and the hypovolemia. For example, patient with severe brain injury or subarachnoid hemorrhage may have neurogenic stand myocardium. So he is hypotensive, but not hypovolemic. Anyway, the other factors like hypo or hypercarpia, hyperthermia, acidosis, anemia, patient with increasing size of hematoma or bleeding increases the intracranial pressure, hyponatremia, hyper and hypoglycemia, hypremia due to the reperfusion and the situ. So all these factors, as you see, can be controlled, changed, and prevented by the anesthesiologist. Now for the enhanced recovery pathway, it is mainly started from the referral, from the primary care and end by follow-up. But our anesthesiologist is involved in these four steps, preoperative, admission, intraoperative, and the postoperative. So we will discuss some point in each step. This is the protocol I suggested, and I am following it in my cases, and I will explain some point of this one. First, regarding the pre-anesthesia clinic, of course, you have some patient and the family education, and pre-operative anemia should be treated, as we will mention now. And the nutrition screening and therapy is this great importance at the moment, attending more uh, attention. And optimization, of course, of chronic disease, like most of the patient coming for any type of surgery, if the patient have obstructive sleep apnea or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease should refer to the pulmonary clinic. Many patients coming for craniotomy may have some adenoma or pressure on the pituitary gland. So if some endocrinology abnormality in this patient, diabetes, insipidus, or whatever, it should be referred to the endocrinology clinic to control his or her condition and like in all patients, smoking and alcohol control. Now we have a lot of advance in the patient education before it was face-to-face -face only, and but now we have pre-operative uh, classroom educations, sorry. And we have information pamphlets, verbal information, text message, educational video, and web-based education. One of the important points I mentioned, the treatment of anemia. We have these guidelines from the 
uh, World Health Organization regarding the definition of anemia, it is more than 13 in man and less than 12 in woman. And any patient coming for surgery, whatever neurosurgical or non-neurosurgical, and expect blood loss more than half liter, it should be investigated for anemia. And if you are treating with intravenous iron or PO, uh, uh, oral uh, tablet, iron tablet, hemoglobin should be more than 13 to minimize the need for transfusion. Also, Frankfurt Conference focus in the same issue. Anemia should be detected and treated, and iron supplementation should be given for the anemic patient. But there is recommendation against erythropoiesis stimulating agent, which should not be used in all patients. Maybe few selection of the patient, but not routine in all patients to be used. Despite this recommendation is applied in some patient coming for major abdominal surgery, this in prevent trial, they found that either the patient who has iron therapy before the surgery or placebo patients, the transfusion rate and the death rate is almost the same. But here in the abdominal surgery, maybe some patient coming with malignancy or uh, cancer patients. So we are, we are not sure why this equal between the iron therapy and the placebo group. Transfusion is the same, 28%, 29%, and the mortality rate is 1% in both group. Actually, because the importance of this study, we have editorial comment in the uh, British Journal of Anesthesia about why this is not changed too much. Because if you are going to treat the anemia and to improve the outcome, you have to target three pillars. Treat preoperative anemia, minimize the intraoperative blood loss, and optimizing the patient physiological tolerance for anemia. If the patient is a little bit anemic, so he should be high, normal volemic to avoid the problem for anemia. If he has some acidosis or metabolic acidosis from anemia, you should treat these physiological parameters to optimize the patient tolerance for anemia. So if we follow this program, targeting the three pillars, anemia, minimize blood loss, imp and improving the physiological tolerance, so we will reduce the blood transfusion, we will reduce the complication, and we may reduce the mortality rate, and the end result is improving the clinical outcome. Now, the second point in the preoperative preparation, the nutrition screening. Actually, they found that the patient with malnutrition have three times greater risk to have complication after surgery, and five times more likely to die if he has malnutrition. So increase complications three times and increase the mortality rate by five times in patient with malnutrition. So what we can do before that, and they found that every one dollar spent for treatment of malnutrition save $52 uh, from the hospital Cost. That's why we are focused now in the treatment or nutritional screen and the therapy. Small, very small steps can be done in the preoperative clinic. Even some questions can be asked by the nurses. First questions about the BMI, it is less than 18.5 or no, or less than 20 in all the patient, more than 65. Second question, unplanned weight loss more than 10% in the last six months. Third question, reduction 50% of the normal diet in the last week. So if we have one of these questions is yes, plus albumin is less than three, the patient should be referred to the nutrition clinic to improve the malnutrition. And again, remember that the increase in the complications three times and increase the mortalities by five times in patients with malnutrition. Now, the intra, uh, immediate preoperative care, you will do like the normal uh, issue in the enhanced recovery pathway, routine fasting, 
avoid benzodiazepine premedication. If the patient on anticonvulsants, it is important to change it from oral to IV for the first or second post-operative day, antibiotic as usual. All these components can be applied for neurosurgical patient. But regarding the preoperative oral carbohydrate load, which is used to reduce the perioperative insulin resistance, and the use of thromboprophylaxis is not clear in our patient. For thromboprophylaxis, this uh, study, more maybe around 2,000 patients with craniotomy, and they found increase in the major breathing event if we are using the Day, second, first day post-operative, you are using inexoparine, increase the intracranial bleeding. So what we can do? We have these uh, guidelines from the Neurocritical Care Society. If the patient low risk for major bleeding and delays the signs of hemorrhagic conversion, that means the tumor is not so vascular and removed easily without surgical complications, we can start fractionated or unfractionated heparin for thromboprophylaxis. So the main issue is that's low risk of major bleeding. Now the intraoperative, as I mentioned, we have 10 points. To use TIVA or inhalational anesthesia, we will discuss it in some details. To use dexamethomidine in all cases, remifentanil in subarachnoid hemorrhage or AV malformation, Invasive monitoring according to the risk of patient and risk of the surgery, and to use lung protective ventilation. Of course, monitoring and reversal of neuromuscular blockers, like in most of the surgical patients, avoid overload for sodium, chloride, water, and glucose. And as you know, all these metabolic abnormalities may cause some brain problems. Normothermia, discontinuation of IV fluid, removal of the line, urinary castor as soon as possible, and multi-model opioid sparing energies. So this is the 10 points. I will discuss some of them, not of all, of course. And all evidence-based and according to the some references. First, to use balanced inhalational anesthesia or total intravenous anesthesia, the classical teaching before to use TIVA in uh, neurosurgery. But actually, both of them are effective for supratentorial craniotomies. Also, in Cochrane database of systemic review, they found that propofol is almost equal to the sevoflurane in the patients. Uh, coming for a brain tumor surgery. Of course, with propofol, post-operative nausea vomiting is less, but there is no firm conclusion to support TIVA over sevoflurane. And as you see, we, one study, two study is almost neutral. One sevoflurane is better and one propofol is better. So you can use tivoflurane or propofol or tiva or inhalational anesthesia in supratonterial craniotomy. If you decide to use inhalational, which is better, sevoflurane or disfluorane? Also before disfluorane, according to the experimental studies, it may increase the intracranial pressure. But this is not reflected on the clinical, uh, clinical use. Theoretically, and don't translate into to the adverse operating conditions. And in conclusions, this fluorine has a very definite place in neurosurgery and the neuroanalysis. So you can use propofol, you can use sevoflurane, and you can use this fluorine in supratentorial perineum. Now, regarding the dexamethomidine, has many changes in the cardiovascular system. The end result is reduction of the cerebral blood flow, and it is coupled by the same way in the reduction of the metabolic rate of the brain. So it is maintained no change in the, or not a, has adverse effect on the brain dexamethomidine. Also, it has anti-inflammatory effect, neuroprotective effect, and anti-delirium effect. 
Dexamethasone also has enhanced the lymphatic system, which clears the brain from the harmful peptide. It is the lymphatic system of the like the other uh, parts of the body, but for the brain, it is named the lymphatic system. They reserve the cognitive dysfunctions after anesthesia, and the end result maintaining both cerebral blood flow and the metabolic needs. So, dexamethasone has a, an excellent role in the neuroanesthesia. Also, it was found to reduce the pain, reduce the post-operative nausea vomiting, reduce opioid obstructions, and stable hemodynamics. And the new uh, guidelines for the management of post-operative nausea and vomiting to use the dexamethasone because it is reduce the opioid consumption. So of course it will reduce the nausea and the vomiting, and the evidence is a one. Now why I mentioned about the remifentanil should be used in patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. In these studies, more than 2,000 patients coming for the clipping, and one group used remifentanil and one group used the fentanyl as intraoperative opioids. The mortality rate with fentanyl is 7.7, .7, and the mortality rate with remifentanil is 4.2 only. So you may ask why it is better to use remifentanil. It is actually like dexamethasone. It is reduce the stress and the endocrine response, reduce the incidence of hyperglycemia and plant the inflammation. So after this huge study, again, 2,760 patients, 760 patients, you can use remifentanin in patients coming for clipping of the intracranial aneurysm. Now, the perioperative fluids and the hemodynamic management, the main goal of post-operative fluid or perioperative fluid to consider the pre-operative fluid, interoperative, and the post-operative as well. Because the improvement in the fluid management, of course, will reduce the complications and will reduce the length of stay in the hospital. In short, the main goals for us, maintaining the normal volumia, avoid salt and water access, <coughs> and intraoperative goal-directed therapy if the patient needs fluids and inotrope and optimize the cerebral blood flow in our neurosurgical patients. So which fluid I will use? Now everybody is aware about the problems for hyperchloremic acidosis, which occurs with normal saline infusion. And before it was telling us ringer lactate is hypoosmolar and should be avoided in the neurosurgical patient. But actually, it because of the effect of hyperchloremic acidosis and the most of the patient you can check for the blood gases easily, it is better to start with the uh, ringer lactate if there is significant hyponatremia or hyper uh, hypoosmolarity, you can use saline or you can use hypertonic saline. Hypercholeramic acidosis is not self-limited benign metabolic phenomenon. It causes a lot of systemic complications. One of the systemic complications, it may cause perioperative renal failure because of the interstitial edema of the renal tissues, also causing nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, and reduction in the gastric mucosal blood flow and pro-inflammatory cytokines production. So in short, we have to use Ringer lactate more than normal saline. In patient coming for supratunterial brain tumors, when plasma light is compared with normal saline, Blood loss is less in the plasma light group. Plasma light, you know, it is balanced uh, crystalloid solutions, but HPH is seven exactly or 7.2. But in Ringer lactate, it is a little bit less. Anyway, the blood loss with the normal saline is around 850 and it is 500 only in plasma light. And the blood transfused, of course, in the normal saline is, group is higher, 600 here, 440. So balanced crystalloid solution has its role in neurosurgical patients, especially sobratentorial tumor. 
Now we come to the monitoring. Simply, if the patient is low risk patient and low risk surgery, just the basic monitoring. But high risk patient or high risk surgery, you have to use uh, stroke volume variations to assess for the fluid responsiveness. And if the patient is high risk and the surgery high risk at the moment, at the same moment, so you need more sophisticated monitoring, cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output. So this is the current recommendations if you are monitoring the patient coming for the enhanced uh, recovery pathway. Actually, the, hemomonitoring, the hemodynamic optimizations reduce many surgical risk factors as well. As you can see here from the systemic review of 53 randomized control trials, the surgical site infection is reduced when goal-directed therapy hemodynamic is used. And when they are using the goal-directed therapy, there is three strategies, either intravascular volume, stroke volume uh, optimization, or stroke volume cardiac output optimization, or intravascular volume and the cardiac output optimization. The best for surgical site infections is intravascular and uh, stroke volume optimization. The same time they found that reduction in the urinary tract infection, so it may reduce the uh, rate of sepsis, also most effective in reducing the post-operative uh, pulmonary complications. So hemodynamic, optimization of the patient, reduce the systemic, the surgical site infection, reduce the pulmonary complications and reduce the urinary tract infection. Now we'll come to the blood transfusion. If the patient has some bleeding intraoperative, so how much is the lower limit of our intraoperative uh, hemoglobin? It is recommended to be nine or more because the conservative strategy, which is applied to the some patient, for example, in critical care, is not applied during acute intraoperative blood loss or during acute resuscitation. You can't take some data from some patient and to apply it for another group of patients. So in short, intraoperative hemoglobin for the neurosurgical patient should be nine or more. Another problem of the anemia, it causes vasoplegia. It is a risk factor of vasoplegia. That means the vessels is not responding for the, the uh, adrenergic stimulation. Simply, intraoperative the patient is hypotensive for any reason. And you are going to start phenylephrine or norepinephrine infusion to control this hypotension. But the patient has poor response or you needing high doses to control this hypotension simply because the patient is anemic and has vasoplegia. Vasoplegia, it is more or less the same like happened for the patient with sepsis as well. So treatment of anemia is important during interoperative management. Lung protective strategies is applied since more than 20 years in ICU now, and still has a good role in the surgical patient, whatever neurosurgery or non neurosurgery and it should be applied for all the patients during the perioperative period. Intraoperative or the, if the patient needs postoperative ventilation and the titration according to the individual basis. Tidal volume rate between six to eight and the PEEP from five to 10 and FIU2, the lowest FIU2, even 30% or 35% is enough to maintain the oxygenation or saturation more than 95, 96, or something like that. When we, they apply the lung protective strategy for the patient coming for the craniotomy, they found that good protective effect and attenuates the systemic inflammatory effect during the surgery, and it is recommended for high-risk patient or prolonged anesthesia. And actually, most of the craniotomy patient at least three, four hours. So it is considered a prolonged anesthesia. So you should have this uh, lung protective ventilation. Now you are coming to the end of your surgery. And as you know, the recovery and the emergence from general anesthesia is associated with many problems. 
systemic activation, patient will be hypertensive, tachycardia, increased oxygen consumption, hypoventilation, and shivering, and being hyperglycemic. As you can see, most of this effect is may affect the brain and may delay the recovery or delicious effect on the brain. So you have to prevent it. For example, small dose of remifentanil, dexamethamidine, or lignocaine before extubation, according to your uh, practice. Of course, all these factors should be normalized in any patient coming for surgery. But again, I have to stress the neurosurgical patient is more sensitive for the normothermia and for the hypo or hyperthermia should be normocarbic and normovolemia, no uh, glucose is controlled well, normotension, normal coagulations, normal osmolarity, and the hemoglobin more than nine to extubate your patient. Despite of that, some patient may have ex delayed extubation, and it depends either on the patient or surgery or the anesthesia. All the patient, as had to, Glasgow Coma Skin, he come less than 13, emergency, anesthesia and the surgery more than five hours, blood loss more than 700. If you, but this, of course, not for craniotomy patient. If the patient coming on the cerebral protective technique, high dose of barbiturate, if you are using total intravenous anesthesia and use the propofol more than 1,000 milligram, again, this will delay the extubation. The same for fentanyl. If the patient needs more than 50 mic per hour of the patient completed uh, after 4 p.m. So if you have one or more factor of that, you may consider the patient may have delayed extubation or may consider the post-operative ventilation. Now we applied the ERAS protocol in patient coming for elective craniotomy. Actually, it is not a lot of paper. Only this paper I found it coming from China, and they included 140 patients. They found that significant benefit from the ERAS protocol if the patient coming for craniotomy, and of course it shortens the time in the hospital without increase in the complications rate. Last point, the post-operative care. Post-operative care, we have three issues, the delirium, pain, and the ICU care. If you are talking about the post-operative cognitive dysfunction and delirium, we may generally, in any type of surgery, you may need one hour. But I will focus in some point in the neurosurgical patient. Neurosurgical patient may have higher incidence because the neurosurgery induced the brain injury, like bleeding, edema, cortical injury, brain retraction, and the effect of electrocutary as well. And you should differentiate and understand the change of the consciousness due to the cognitive dysfunctions. Simply after the end of the surgery, early in the recovery room, the patient may have just emergence delirium. But within 24 hours, the patient may have post-operative delirium, and after that, the patient may have post-operative cognitive dysfunctions. Why it is important to recognize this delirium early? Because delirium, still the brain is normal, not change it too much. That's the effect of surgery and maybe the effect of anesthesia. But if the patient has cognitive dysfunction, they start to have structural brain, brain damage due to the imbalance in the neurotransmitters. If it is not recognized and not treated well, the patient will have permanent brain damage, this is dementia. That's why the importance to detect delirium early. Actually, there is a lot of causes according pre-operative, intraoperative, post-operative. It is difficult to discuss all these issues, but it can be found in a lot of patients especially like electrolyte disturbance, alcoholic patient, smoking, patient with history of stroke before or carotid stenosis, patient coming with anxiety or depression, diabetes, hypertension, all preoperative risk factors. Interoperative depends mainly on the surgery and minimally on the types of the anesthesia. Cardiovascular and hip surgery, emergency, lung surgery, the more tissue damage, the more the extent of the surgery, the higher incidence of cognitive dysfunction. Post-operative, if you look for that, you can see, you can control and change all these factors, pain, hypoxemia, 
low albumin anemia, electrolyte disturbance, and you can treat and prevent infection. Anyway, it is difficult to discuss every point now. In this study, coming patient for brain tumor, they found the incidence of cognitive dysfunction is about 15%. And we have three types of the most operative delirium, hypoactive, hyperactive, and mixed. The most important and the dangerous is hypoactive, because the hypoactive, you will see the patient is sleeping, you may consider it from the side effect of the opioid or post operative, but actually he has some delirium. And there is some specific test, psychological test can be done to detect this hypoactive delirium. Again, it is not our scope of the moment, but just to know it is hypoactive, hyperactive, and mixed. And again, the risk factors like we discussed before, especially in neurosurgical patient, long surgery, physical restraint, electrolytes, older age, uh, older age, sorry, tobacco use and history and the many risk factor of post-operative delivery. That's what we mentioned before. Now, how to prevent that? This is early recovery or the enhanced recovery. We have what is named dream approach. This the patient can, should be drink, eat, control pain, move and sleep within 12 hours. Maybe it can be applied for some other surgical subspeciality. It is difficult to apply it to the neurosurgical patients, but after 12 hours, if the surgery is straightforward and there is no residual drowsiness or vertigo or nausea and vomiting, most of the patient can follow the dream approach. Drink, eat, analgesia, move, and sleep. If the patient have post-operative delirium, what I can do? Review all the history, medications, electrolyte, physical examination. If some factors you can correct it, you sure you should correct and optimize the metabolic status of the patient. If it is hypoactive delirium, you can use haloperidol. If hyperactive, again, haloperidol plus or minus lorazepam. And if difficult to control all that refractory cases, he may need ICU admission or may start to short doses of propofol or dexmethamine infusion. So this is the approach for the patient who may de de develop post-operative delirium and can apply for all types of post-operative patient, not for neurosurgery only. Now, the control of pain, it is post craniotomy pain is still a uh, real headaches because it is not treated well. Most of us are afraid to give a lot of opioids. The patient may be drowsy and the patient may have vomiting. So we have to balance between inadequate analgesia and the side effects of the opioid. Infratentorial may be higher incidence of being than supratentorial. And they found that the cut of the muscles or muscle damage is relatively higher incidence of pain. And now ultrasound is used in all types of block and it can be applied in the craniotomy as well. And as you see, this is the nerve supply of the skull and each nerve of that can be localized by the ultrasound probe and the block. And this again may need maybe 30 minutes at least to explain everything. Anyway, for example, if the supraorbital nerve, you can put the probe transverse over the orbit and you can localize the lateral supraorbital nerve foramen and the medial supraorbital nerve as well. And you can inject two to three ml of uh, bobivacaine here. Also for the uh, auriculotemporal nerve, which is very close to the uh, temporal artery, you can localize the artery and the nerve and you can inject the local analgesic. The good point is that you can use just two to three ml for each nerve block, so you will minimize the use of the local anesthetics. And the issue is that there is a lot of variations on the fromina. It is not classic in all patients. And the course of the nerve also may be variable. So ultrasound guided scalp block may help for pain control. But to be honest, I am, don't have good experience yet just to start it to see is it uh, effective or no. And you can see this article is just published two months back. 
So hopefully we can improve ourselves by uh, ultrasound scalp flow. So which medication I should use for to control the pain? This according again for train database systemic review of all the medication used for post craniotomy pain. Non-steroidal is effective. Low evidence to use brigapaline and gabapentin or scalp infiltration. Scalp plug dexamethamidine may have good effect. So you can use non-steroidal paracetamol and you can use a scalp block and dexamethamidine interoperative. So this is the suggested protocol by myself. I am using it. Ketamine 0.5 milligram, this before skin incision. And paracoxy 40 milligram, paracetamol one gram and skin infiltration by the neurosurgeon 1% lignokin. Before the end of surgery, you give oxycodone or morphine 0.1 milligram per kg. And the world infiltration by Pubivacin 0.5. Now you can use ultrasound guided if you have good experience. Post operative, paracetamol regular, baricoxy regular for three doses only, and oxycodone or morphine for breakthrough pain. Actually, by this protocol, most of the patients in the first 24 hours, you can control the pain well with minimal use of morphine or oxycodone. The last point that early uh, removal of the lines and the urinary castor, early feeding, early mobilization, this is the dream uh, approach that we mentioned, and the prophylaxis, of course, for DVT, gastric ulcer, nausea, vomiting, and infection. So in short, I am presenting a protocol for the supratentorial craniotomy, including these five points, and I explained some of them. And hopefully you have some benefits from my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yasser. Just I can start by uh, questions from my side and the just discussion. Uh, first of all, we have to clarify for all the candidates about the idea of ERAS. I know the idea. Can you please minimize, for example, how, long, how the length is minimized by, after using this protocol? For example, what was the median length of stay for the patient with neurological surgery? And second, what is your, uh, have you tried to do carbohydrate loading? Uh, no, I'm just speaking about the difference in length of stay between the patients using RAS protocol and the, all, <coughs> and the other patient not using the protocol. And also the carbohydrate, preoperative carbohydrate loading. Preoperative car carbohydrate is tested specifically in the neurosurgical patient. And as you know, many of the patient may have uh, vomiting from the, some increased intracranial pressure or something. So it is not tested the pre operative carbohydrate load in our neurosurgical patient, and I didn't try it. Maybe it has some benefits in some patient or in other enhanced recovery pathway in other uh, surgical subspeciality, but I have no information about its use specifically in neuroanesthesia. Uh, um, a second observation, uh, what about the difference in length of stay in patient using, uh, in, in especially in neurosurgery, Impatient with ERAS protocol, impatient with not ERAS protocol. See, actually, the patient coming for craniotomy, it may be semi elective. So, as you know, many patients coming with brain tumor is presented maybe just a few days before the uh, surgery. So, to apply all the concept of the enhanced recovery pathway in this patient is not as difficult to uh, do that. Anyway, by the time by time, we may modify our protocol to adapt to all the components of the ERAS pathway. Okay, the first question coming from uh, Borhan uh, Kazmal about dexamethidine uh, causes bradycardia. Yeah, Should yeah. we worry in case of high ICP and, and presence because, yeah. of Cushing thread? Uh, uh, if, the, if he is some 
conservative use of dexamethomidine, usually after opening of the dura and there is the intracranial pressure is reduced, you can use it. I didn't feel any problem with dexamethomidine for intraoperative use. Bradycardia may happen, but occasionally need glycopyrrolate or atropine to treat it. So you are using it in open the skull, not in closed the skull. Even it's used in the neurocritical aid care for the sedation of the patient, it has a good option as well. It is a lot, there is a lot of papers about that. It is not a personal opinion. You can use dexamethomidine in the patient without uh, any problem. Uh, I think uh, second question you previously answered, is there any specific considering intraoperative neuromonitoring? You answered this. And the third question, yeah. how to use dynamic indices as a stroke volume variation and low tidal volume, lung protective strategy also, any effect when using we increase PEEP on uh, ICP? Yeah, regarding the use of, yeah. Regarding uh, the uh, of the- My opinion, uh, I don't have, I don't have any uh, contradiction between using stroke volume no, variation no. and uh, low tidal volume. No, no, actually no. The use of the intraoperative it is low tidal volume, uh, protective ventilation, tidal volume is six to eight. And in most of the patient, if you're applying five beep, it is not affecting the, according to the machine you are using. And our, most of the machine we are used, we don't have a great problem in the uh, monitoring of the hemodynamics. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rassif, for this uh, highly Welcome. informative lecture Thank about you. the new Thank surgery. You. Uh, you think you did uh, as in we in Sayyidina Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Thank you. Uh, yeah.